Hi, I'm very excited about this review as I have been waiting for this unit for quite a bit. I requested this arbitrary waveform generator from Banggood a while ago for a review, but uh, it was out of stock at the time. So after waiting patiently for quite some time, it is finally here. The reason I'm excited about this AWG is that it is priced very affordably and competitively for hobbyists. And it is packed with features. The 30 Mac version, the UTG 932E, comes in just above $100. And the version I have here is the 60 Mac version, UTG 962E, and it costs just a little bit more than the 30 Mac version. Remember, both the 932E and 962E are dual channel versions, which makes this arbitrary waveform generator even more versatile. I will leave a link in the video description down below for those who are interested in getting one. Now, in order not to make the video too long, I will go through some of the obvious features quickly and concentrate on some of the not too obvious features that I think are important, and then we will take it apart and see what's inside. The AWG comes in a pretty mundane box, but uh, it does have everything you need to get started. This includes a power adapter with interchangeable plugs so that this unit is compatible in most of the markets around the world. And it also comes with uh, two BNC cables, one BNC to BNC, and the other one is a BNC to banana plugs. And uh, that should uh, uh, be plenty to get you started. Now, it also, forget to mention, it also comes with this uh, cable that is a USB to a barrel uh, plug. And uh, the, the power plug here is a 5 volt. At 2.1 amps. So I think you can use a power bank to easily convert this to a battery powered version. Now, just for some reference, the size of this AWG is very, very small. And as you can see here, it is just a little bit wider than a standard full size multimeter here. Now, there is PC software for this UWT AWG, specifically for creating arbitrary waveforms. And uh, there's no CD or anything in the package except that uh, you have this uh, pamphlet and tells you where to download the specific software from the Unity website. And we'll get to this a little bit later in the video. Let's take a quick look at its specs. And uh, here I have the spec listed side by side. And you can see both of the units here. And interestingly, that for the 962E, which is the version we're talking about here, has the 60 megahertz bandwidth. And if you look at the uh, spec here, that you will see the 60 megahertz really only applies to the sinusoidal wave. And in fact, for square waves, the maximum frequency you can reach is 20 megahertz versus 15 megahertz for the 932E. And uh, same with the pulse output as well. But for other waveforms, you can see that the, the output of maximum frequency are actually the same. And uh, besides that frequency range differences, everything else appear to have the same specification here. And uh, towards the end of the PDF manual, there is a section talking about the performance and I highlighted a few things here for us to take a look. Uh, you can see here the harmonic distortion is pretty good towards the lower frequency range at minus 60 dBc, but uh, when the frequency gets higher, especially from the 30 to 60 megahertz frequency range, it's only 40 dB down from the carrier. And also we can see the uh, spurious signal distortion here. And uh, again, it is not all that shabby. Especially the phase noise, you can see that when the output frequency is less than 10 megahertz, it's at minus 125 dBc per hertz, which is actually pretty good. Anyway, spec-wise, there's nothing extraordinary. However, putting everything into perspective, that we're talking about a piece of test equipment that is just above $100. So everything actually looks quite good from that perspective. Now I have connected power to the UTG 962E and also I have the channel 1 output into an oscilloscope back there so that you can get a visual representation of what is going on on the oscilloscope while I'm playing around on this UTG 962E. But if I do, if I need to show you the waveform in detail, I will make sure that the oscilloscope is in focus. And now let's power it on.
And as you can see, it is really uh, relatively quick. It only took about three seconds to fully boot up. And uh, what you're looking at here is the factory default upon power up. It is uh, highlighted at the channel one is selected here. But notice that right now there's no output because both channels are off. Now the interface here is really intuitive. You press for instance, uh, channel one, it will turn on channel one. Of course, right now nothing is showing because uh, the amplitude is fairly low. And if you press channel two, as you can see here, it actually switches to channel two. The entire background changes to a different color, indicating that, uh, telling you that right now you are adjusting channel two settings. Now, if you press channel two again, channel two will be turned on. And uh, again, for example, right now we press channel one, it comes back to channel one. So th there is a little bit of getting used to it as the first time you press channel two, it doesn't turn on because it just simply switches to channel two. Anyway, let's come back to channel one. And again, the user interface is very straightforward and you can use the rotor encoder to uh, select which parameter you want to change and if you want to change it you can press it down and uh, change the value here for, for instance we want to change the amplitude here we can use the rotary encoder to change and of course we can just use the keypad here as well you press 5 and uh, we can do 5 volts peak to peak and you can see that uh, the waveform is updated and back to the wave menu you can see that we have square wave and uh, of course we can go back and you can see we have pause, we have ramp, and uh, we, of course we have the arbitrary waveform, which is one of the key selling point of this uh, UTG962E. One thing to note is that the, by default, the channel one, channel two output are set as high Z, meaning high impedance. And uh, this unit actually supports output of 50 ohms, 75 ohms, and uh, high impedance as well, which is very useful. Now, our oscilloscope right now is set up as a 50 ohm. So let's uh, change the setting here to match it to 50 ohm. To do that, I'm going to utility, and I'm going to channel set one settings. And uh, let's see, right now it's at the load. So let's press this. And we should be able to, uh, actually, let's press load. Yep, we should change it to 50 ohm, which is uh, now matching the impedance of our oscilloscope. And now I have the output set to a 10 megahertz uh, sinusoidal, and uh, I wanted to increase the frequency, and we'll see how good the waveform looks. Of course, later on, we can use a spectral analyzer to do the detailed analysis. And as you can see, at the 60 megahertz, the actual output is very, very uh, good. There's no visible distortion of any kind whatsoever. Now for square waves, although the maximum frequency you can reach is at 20 megahertz, but you will notice that actually the maximum usable frequency range is lower than that. We'll see why that is the case. Now, if you look at the oscilloscope back there, you will see that we have this uh, rising edge at roughly uh, almost three quarters of a radical, which is uh, meaning it's roughly around 15 nanoseconds. And right now you can see that our frequency is set as 100 kilohertz. So if we increase the frequency, you will see that uh, actually the rising edge does not change. So that's really fixed. So what we're going to do is we will increase it to 2 megahertz, 3 megahertz. You will see that at 10 megahertz, uh, the wave already looks not so great. And if we keep increasing the frequency, the of course the rising edge and the falling edge because they are in excess of uh, 15 nanoseconds they're going to kind of collide so your waveform going to look more like a sinusoidal here so basically at the 20 megahertz you are essentially looking at a sinusoidal waveform the modulation capability of this utg 962e is actually very sophisticated you can basically use any of these waveforms to modulate any of these waveforms, and I will show you what that means. 
Right now I'm outputting a 1 MHz sinusoidal and the amplitude is at uh, 2.5 volts. I'm going to change the amplitude a little bit higher so we can see the waveform a little bit better. Again, as I said, you can use a rotary encoder or you can use the keypad here. So I'm going to change to 5 volts peak to peak. And now let me turn on the modulation by pressing the mode button. And in my opinion, this mode button really should be called mod as that is controlling the modulation anyway. So by default, it is doing an AM amplitude modulation. And right now we're modulating at 100 hertz using a sinusoidal waveform. So let's change that to, uh, let's say, one kilohertz so that we can see that on the oscilloscope better. And now we're at one kilohertz. And you can see the beautiful modulated signal on the uh, oscilloscope here. So of course, you can change many other factors as well. For instance, you can change the modulation depth. We will do some over modulation here. As you will see here, we can do 120%. You will see the uh, characteristic of the over modulated sinusoidal back there. And of course, we can uh, reduce the modulation depth as well. So let's uh, reduce it. And you can see that no problem at all. And of course, we can use other waveforms to modulate the carrier sine wave. So for instance, we can change to square wave. And uh, we can also change to up ramp. We can change to down ramp so on and so forth. We can even use arbitrary waveform to modulate the carrier waveform. For instance, right now we're using a uh, arbitrary, which is uh, the absolute sign to modulate the waveform. Of course, now we lost synchronization there, but you get the idea here. And of course, besides amplitude modulation, you can do phase modulation, frequency modulation, frequency shift keying, and you can also do sweep, which we will show that with the spectral analyzer. And uh, so there's quite a bit of functionality here. And remember right now the input carrier waveform is only in sinusoidal. And you can change your uh, carrier frequency, carrier waveform to different waveforms as well. Now I have hooked up the output from this arbitrary waveform generator to the spectral analyzer via this DC block here. And now I have the spectral analyzer configured to start sweeping at 1 MHz and stop sweeping at 60 MHz. That's essentially the bandwidth of our UTG962E. And currently I'm outputting a 30 MHz sinusoidal at 500 mV peak to peak. So that's the peak you see here in the center of the screen here. Now you can see actually there's some very obvious phase noise uh, on this uh, main peak on the side here. And uh, these are about 40 dB down from the carrier. So that is actually in line with what the specification is. And you can also see these uh, harmonic lines popping up. Now, not all lines are harmonic, but right now when, you, when we're at the 30 megahertz, these are indeed harmonics. If I switch the frequency, you can see that uh, the harmonics actually changes. And at so some point, you will see that not only we have harmonics, but we have other spectral lines popping up as well. Now, this is because the DDS synthesizer and some of these spectral lines are actually folding back into the frequency range that we're looking at. So that's why we have additional peaks popping up here and there. And this is just due to the artifacts introduced by the DDS synthesizer. And we can see these unwanted uh, spectral lines even better. If I change the stop frequency to 100 megahertz, so let me do that right here. So now you can see we have even more of these. Now if I started sweeping this uh, from 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, you will see them popping up at different spots. Now interestingly, at 50 megahertz, that's the cleanest. You actually don't see a lot of these uh, uh, frequency components at all. So that is just uh, inherent to the synthesizer design. What I'm going to do next is to show you the noise spectrum supported by this arbitrary waveform generator. So for that, I'm going to change the frequency back to 60 megahertz. And I'm going to adjust the 
waveform to noise. And uh, as you can see, as soon as we change it to noise, let me just show you down here, and now we're outputting noise, you can see we have a pretty uniform noise spec uh, spectrum here. And that's actually very good. That's to be desired as given how flat this noise spectrum is, you can easily use this to calibrate one of your, let's say, filters or amplifiers by putting in this noise spectrum and see what is coming out from the other side to determine how flat your amplifier performance is. And of course, this can also be used to calibrate your filters. And the idea is the same. You put in this uh, noise spectrum and at the output, you can see the peak at which that's your center frequency of your filter. And also I wanted to show you the sweep capability of this uh, arbitrary waveform generator. So for that, let's uh, take a look. We go to wave, we go to, oh sorry, we go to modulation and uh, we go to line and that's actually our sweep so the start frequency we can change it to one kilohertz that's fine uh, stop frequency let's change it to 60 megahertz and now we're sweeping so let's take a look at the spectral analyzer here and you can see it is sweeping so of course in order to see the better we can uh, uh, turn on the max hold and you will see eventually we should obtain a relatively flat line and which means the output is very leveled here and you can see that from a very low frequency up to, all the way up to 60 megahertz the full bandwidth it is really really flat again this can be used to test your filter as well of course because it's not in sync with our spectral analyzer you have to wait for a bit but you can see that uh, eventually everything uh, gets smoothed out here. And of course, being a two-channel function generator, you can use it to do some interesting stuff. And here, what I'm showing on the oscilloscope is a leisure figure here, and that is generated using both of the channels. And uh, one thing to uh, point out is that both channels actually can be independent and also be in sync. So right now I'm going to show you here. You can see that when you go to system, you can see we have an option of sync output. And right now, both channels are face in sync, meaning that they are locked together. And if you uh, change this to be independent, and uh, both channels would be outputting the signal frequencies independently, at some point, they're gonna drift apart. In fact, these two channels' frequencies are very close. You have to stay here for about uh, 20 minutes for the phase shift to start occurring on the oscilloscope. And uh, so I'm not going to uh, show you that, but I just wanna point out, you can lock these two channels together uh, to make their face in sync. So of course we can change the face of a waveform here and you will see that uh, the circle on the oscilloscope will change accordingly. So let me do that. And which is a, there's a lot of fun here. Of course, we can also change the frequency and uh, you will see that the pattern on the screen would also change. So that's your classic laser drawer figure here. And of course, these are uh, some of the integer multiplies. And if we multiples, if we go back to channel one, and we also change the frequency here, you will see uh, additional patterns started emerging. And of course, we're not just limited to this sinusoidal wave. We can also change the wave to different uh, types. So we can do, for instance, here with the square wave. Of course, there's nothing interesting to see, but uh, you get a point here. You can change it to ramp, and you get all sorts of uh, interesting figures. You can even do this with arbitrary wave as well. For instance, we can change it to the the sign here. Uh, sorry, this is actually the, the one we just used. This is a uh, 
complex waveform, but we can change it to different waveforms as well. And uh, so there's a lot of interesting stuff you can play around with. By the way, I also wanted to point out a couple of other functionalities this UTG962E offers, and one of which is its frequency counting capability. So for that, we can change it to uh, utilities, and you can see here we have a counter option. And for that, I'm inputting a signal into the FSK counting sync socket here. And for that, I'm inputting the signal from my WaveTech 100 megahertz synthesized waveform generator up there. And uh, by the way, according to the manual of this utg 96 ue the input has to be TTL compatible. So just to be aware of that. So I have already changed the amplitude and uh, offset so that it's a TTL signal. And currently I'm outputting a one megahertz waveform and I haven't turned on the synthesizer output yet, but let me put it onto the counter side and you can see by default it's waiting for me to enable that output so now let me enable that output and we'll come back and take a look at uh, the reading here so actually let me just uh, tilt it so you can see better so now i'm enabling it and as soon as i enabled it you can see that it's not that bad it's reading at roughly one megahertz so now i'm going to change the output to let's say 10 megahertz and you should see that going up as well, 10 megahertz, and uh, not too bad at all. And uh, let's change it to, let's see how high we can go. Maybe we can go to 40 megahertz. I think that's the highest for the sinusoidal wave. And indeed, now we're reading a little bit off, but uh, um, in fact, quite, quite a bit off. So I guess we can change a different uh, waveform to see how that uh, behaves. Now, of course, this is not intended for a frequency counter, and but it does give you some rough idea of what the inputting frequency is. Now, I have to check the spec as what the, the highest reading it can go, but right now it's a 32 megahertz, and we ha we're showing 32 megahertz and no problem. So let, give me a few seconds. Let me change that uh, input waveform to a square wave, and we'll take the same measurement again. And now I have adjusted the WaveTech to output a one megahertz square wave signal. And as you can see, we're measuring that signal nicely here. So let me increase the frequency to see uh, if we have the similar issue at uh, higher frequencies compared to what we did with the sinusoidal output. So right now we're at 40 megahertz again, and uh, no problem at all. So clearly this uh, unit is designed to measure at least to optimized to measure square wave instead of a sinusoidal input. By the way, right now the square wave is also at the TTL level. So let me increase it a little bit more to 50 megahertz. That's the maximum I can output from the wave tech. And as you can see, there's some, I'm not sure why it's blanking out, but uh, the reading you see there is accurate. So anyway, so uh, that's the frequency counting capability of this UTG962E. Another functionality I wanted to point out is that this UTG962E can output a DC voltage. So in a pinch, you can use this as a voltage source. For that, I'm going to change the waveform to a DC output. And we can then change the output to the desired voltage. So let's do just one volt and turn on the output. And interestingly, as you can see, actually right now we're saying one volt, it clearly says it's from ground to the voltage, but we're measuring two volts. Uh, not entirely sure why that is the case. Let's change it to two volts. Yeah, it's four volts. So somehow it doubled, but this one also can output a negative polarity as well. So we can go down to minus one and uh, it's showing one at minus 1.978, minus two. And you can see that the accuracy is not that great. So let's see the resolution here. If I just, well, let's do it positive one volt. Um, let's see, okay, now it's a 2.010. Let's change one one. Yeah, so 
it seems that there's some a lot of quantization error and that that's probably due to the deck although the deck is at uh, 14 bits so that should have enough resolution so not entirely sure how they implemented this uh, voltage output but you know this is uh, just a, a rough voltage anyway but nevertheless it has that functionality now i'm going to change the output uh in, in instead of a 50 ohm let's change it to the high impedance to see if uh, that has any bearing on what we're seeing here so let's do high z and uh, so we'll go, go back to wave yep so from high z it seems uh, in this mode the output actually matches what we're seeing on the display here so let's go again go to DC and uh, let's change it to zero volts uh, so we can reset that and we'll start one volt yep that is interesting so when we're in high Z mode the output is actually the the value the output value indicated here is actually exactly what is being outputted and also we can go higher in this uh, high z mode as well so let's go to 10 volts actually that's not too bad um, we can go from i would assume we can go down to negative 10 volts as well again the accuracy here is not the greatest as you can see we have uh, at least 25 millivolts out but uh, that's not the intention of this functionality. So as you can see, we can actually go out from negative 10 volts to positive 10 volts. As I mentioned earlier, the UTG962E also came with the PC software and you can download it from Unity's website. And here I have downloaded it and installed everything. So, you really just need to install the device manager installer it automatically installs the visa driver and the usb driver as well but sometimes i heard that from forum people saying that it didn't install correctly so you will come back here and install the driver specifically to your os anyway once you installed you will see this icon the device manager on your desktop and if you launch it you're gonna take some time as it scans for devices here and hopefully it will find your connected uh, device and i have connected my 962e to the usb so it should be able to identify it and here we go you can see that it has identified the device correctly so now you right click on it and there are a couple of uh, apps you can run one is the virtual control panel and the other is arbitrary waveform editor so first let's come to the virtual control panel and this is essentially just a replica of what you are looking at your uh, unit itself except it's on the computer and when you switch here uh, what is displayed on your device will change accordingly and once you have this running though you can't press any keys on your device as you can only control it through the uh, the control panel here so anyway so let's uh, power it off for now and let's run the arbitrary waveform editor here now with this ad arbitrary waveform editor you should be able to create any waveform that you want and then upload onto the device itself uh, let's uh, accept the default you can see you can you can set the sample rate and also the sample time as well so we'll leave it as default for 100 samples per second and uh, uh, the sample time is 10 seconds so let's do that and uh, now we are greeted with this interface the the first thing you notice is it's a kind of actually quite rudimentary you can uh, do a free draw draw a line and insert some waveform itself now in order for you to be able to pinpoint exactly what you are doing here uh, you have to use the insert here for instance you can uh, you can approximate different waveforms using the existing waveform here and if you want to draw lines you can come to this line option and you can see that you you have the start voltage 
end voltage and the uh, number of points you want to draw. So that's when you want it to finally control what you are doing here. Now, of course, you can always do it by hand. And this is a lot easier, but you do lose the control of the precision. I do wish they have some kind of indicator while you're moving your mouse and it shows you what uh, the time point and also the voltage it is currently at, but it doesn't have any of those. So for this exercise, let's draw a staircase and we're going to draw it uh, uh, single sided. So let's start, as you can see already, it's very hard to uh, make it precise. And uh, so if it's not precise, we just have to uh, deal with it. And uh, as you can see, it's very, very hard to control this PC software. Uh, again, because you don't know what point the voltage is, so you have to guess. Uh, so that's another limitation of this free hand drawing software here. And uh, so let's just go up and I'm going to uh, attempt finishing up the staircase and to make sure at least it is semi decent here. So let's uh, keep going. So far so good. And I'm actually pretty satisfied at what I did so far, but uh, I'm barely half done. And you can see that uh, you don't have a snap to point functionality either. So everything really is hard to control for sure. And of course, once you make a mistake, you really can't erase portion of the drawing. You have to start from beginning again, which is not ideal. But again, we're just uh, uh, doing some illustration here. So the quality of the waveform does not matter that much. I just wanted to finish this uh, drawing here. Almost done. Ah. So when you are about to, uh, when you are done, all you need to do is right click, I believe. And that should terminate. The current join. Yep. So now we're done with the join. So naturally, you wanted to uh, download this file. It really, this means just to save the file. So we'll save it. And I, oh, actually, sorry, download the file it really means download to the device. Uh, so we'll, we'll come back to this in just momentarily. And we wanted to download current ARB. So you can see I already tried a few things here and there. And let's just save it over that staircase. And uh, yes, export data OK. And the next thing is uh, exactly as what we just saw earlier, the download file. It's trying to find uh, the device. Of course, it can't find the device. And this is where a lot of people get stuck because they thought, oh, something's broken. You can't uh, download the, uh, the waveform here. Now, I don't know why Unity didn't uh, make this version work with the device itself. Uh, which is really unfortunate, as otherwise it would be super helpful. It would be super easy for you to design your waveform and upload it, even though the design itself is a little bit rudimentary. But anyway, so the point here is you can't upload the waveform using the uh, this fun this application itself. You have to change it back to the other application, which which is a virtual control panel. So I'll show you how to do that. So now you can launch the virtual control panel. And what, what is happening is you can right click on uh, the screen here and you will see this uh, send ARB file. So this is where you can send the file that you just created to the unit itself. So let's uh, come here and uh, let's choose the waveform we just created. And I think that's staircase. And let's open. And let's load and watch what is uh, going to happen on the screen itself. So we hit load. As soon as this is loaded, and you will see both on the computer screen and also on the unit itself, the arbitrary waveform that is uh, uh, being uploaded. Now, of course, you can actually output this onto your oscilloscope or do whatever you want with it. Now, the disappointing part is this is not going to persist. In fact, uh, by the way, as I mentioned earlier, you cannot press any of the buttons while you are in this mode, which is really unfortunate. But if you come back to, uh, let's see, I think it's wave. 
maybe not. And, and this unit, you know, the on-screen menu is really slow to respond, so it's pretty helpless. But okay, so let, let's do this. Let me just unplug the USB so that I can use my finger to uh, control the keys here. And uh, so what I'm going to show you is if you hit the ARB, you will see that uh, this is actually stored as one of the external uh, data points. But the problem of this is actually it's not going to persist. In other words, when you power off the unit and power back on, this waveform is gone. So you will either have to uh, stay very close to where you want to use this unit and hook on the computer and load your waveform and then immediately use it, or you have to basically make sure that the power is connected because if you power off this unit and power it back on, the waveform is gone. So that clearly is a very disappointing uh, for otherwise a very good uh, functionality here as without able to persist this waveform, it just becomes very uh, clunky that you have to every single time use a computer to upload the waveform. But I suppose you get what you pay for and uh, Unity does have higher spec units that supposedly uh, have a better functionality than this but this is the price point that you get and i just opened up this unit is actually fairly simple to open it up it was held in by these four screws on the side and uh, so it actually opens in half and so let's take a look at this half this is only connected by this ribbon cable which is easily to be removed now this is the part for uh, the display and uh, the input so there's really not much going on here and the main chip here we don't have any marking looks like it is being sent it off but we do have a wind bound uh, memory chip here so there's nothing exciting on this front panel here we do have a regulator here as well but you can see that we do have the print uh, the program headers exposed here so presumably if you know what you're doing you can either sniff out the signal or do some kind of uh, reverse engineering from using this uh, headers here and uh, so by the look of it this unit at least this board was made somewhere in 2019 and uh, April 28th so it's been a year uh, or two now we also have this unpopulated footprint here not entirely sure what that's doing here so in order to take a look at what is inside there I need to remove these uh, screws here so give me one minute I will uh, be right back and the main board is actually very easy to take out as well after just remove some of these uh, shielding cover and the whole board slides out. And the first thing you notice is how many relays are there. There are actually five of these in each channel here. And that's why whenever you switch ranges or changes the output, you hear the relay clicking while you are doing the operation here. And uh, the reason might be that some of these, for instance, for gain control, the op amps use this might not be able to cover the full range. That's why you need the relay to switch in different components. The op amps used in each of the channels are just uh, some standard TL071, which is nothing fancy. And uh, of course, towards top here, you can tell by the topology here, this is your DC DC converter, even though the chip is sanded off. And uh, of course, the main part here is this FPGA under the heat sink. I'm not going to take it uh, off because just by the look of everything else, I'm sure the marking is also sanded off. Now, I did a quick search on EV blog and saw that these two, uh, presumably the DAC, uh, according to some people, uh, did some little bit of a pin out to reverse engineering and uh, figure out those are probably AD 9744. So these are 14 bits, 210 mega sample per second DAX. And again, just by looking at this board, you can see how clean everything is laid out. And uh, certainly the designers had put a lot of thought in there. And if you can see here between each channels, we have this uh, metal barrier serves as uh, your shielding to reduce the crosstalk between different channels. And uh, towards the bottom left here, you can see the JTAG pin headers for the FPGA. 
So let me flip it over and take a look at it on the reverse side. And I don't think there's too much to it. And indeed, there are not that many components. And again, towards the bottom here, you can see some sort of a DC-DC converter. And this one, by the look of it, uh, the marking says it's a VBA4338. That's really just a MOSFET here. So clearly this is a, your DC-DC converter portion again by the look of this inductor. And then we have some discrete transistors and whatnot. Those are used to switch your relays perhaps. And that's pretty much all I got for you in this video. If you enjoyed the video, please remember to smash that like button. And more importantly, remember to subscribe to the channel so that you won't miss any interesting topics in the future. I will catch up with you next time.